My name is Marcia Meskimen, and I'm the director of the Institute of Advanced Studies here at Loughborough University, and it is my great pleasure to be welcoming colleagues to this hybrid format. So I am welcoming a number of colleagues who are here with us today at the Institute, which is wonderful to see. And it's nice to have a, uh, an audience in real life, and also to those of you who are joining us in some instances from very far away um, for this wonderful uh, seminar today. So very much welcome if you are here as the virtual IAS and very much welcome if you are here in the actual space. I'm going to say a few words from the IAS and then I'm going to be turning over to a very good colleague of mine, Ariana Mayorani, who will do a formal introduction of Jason Hereliak. What I want to say is we are welcoming today Jason, um, who has been with us for almost a month as an IAS residential fellow, and we are really looking forward to his um, uh, presentation today on climate change games. But also, I'd like to say that we have in, entirely and thoroughly enjoyed his stay with us as a residential fellow. And when we introduced the residential fellowship program at um, the IAS, it was really to encourage colleagues just like Jason, who had incredibly interesting interdisciplinary projects, who were working with some colleagues of ours here at the university already, but also who could find a space uh, to work at this institution, um, meeting other colleagues, extending some of the networks, and developing projects. And I am very aware that with Ariana and other colleagues at the university, he is um, currently looking at how this work that has been done over here um, as a residential scholar is something that is gonna go forward. And what we are really hoping is that we keep in touch on these conversations and develop these discussions going forward um, through the Institute. So it is with my great pleasure to say that we have had a fantastic um, visit and we are um, welcoming Jason to come and talk to us about work that we already know has been um, thrilling um, uh, in terms of his in game theory uh, at the doctoral college, and we are now looking forward to this conversation. With that said, I want to allow uh, Ariana to take over to do uh, a, a fulsome um, introduction, both to the project and also to Jason. Ariana. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much, Marcia. I'm really happy to present Jason Morelia today, who is Associate Professor of Game Studies and the Director of the Center for Digital Humanities at Brock University in Canada, where he teaches in the Game Design and Interactive Arts and Science programs. He's also the incoming Graduate Program Director of the MA in Game Studies program, the first of its kind in Canada. He has held numerous grants funding projects in game studies, game-based learning, post-secondary education policy, and knowledge mobilization. His current research is funded by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, and he has also published an extensive number of journal articles, chapters, and public-facing scholarship in a wide range of areas, including game studies, game design, open source networks, and multimodality. He's also a co-founder of the online game studies periodical, First Person Scholar, which is approaching its 10th anniversary later this year. His 2018 monograph, Multimodal Semiotics and Rhetoric in Video Games, is a one-of-a-kind groundbreaking volume published by Rutledge that combines the fields of game studies and multimodal studies, and really, really shows how Jason's expertise and unique approach managed to build effective bridges between these areas, that's filling a long-standing research gap and providing a unique opportunity for creating new interdisciplinary research paths that also address the role and impact of video games in relation to the current world issues. I am particularly happy to introduce him today and extremely, extremely grateful to the Institute of, of the Advanced Studies for this opportunity, as his fellowship, as Mark and Marcia anticipated, uh, marks the beginning of a research collaboration with me and the rest of the Kiwi Semiotics team at Loughborough University and Bremen University, whose current research funded by the AHRC in the UK and the DFG in Germany, will inform a research proposal for applying our results to EDI-related knowledge transfer into the world of video games production. It is no surprise then that the title of Jason's talk today is Running Out of Time. 
how climate change gains represent urgency and the consequences of inaction. Up to you, Daisy. Great, thank you so much, Ariana, for that lovely introduction. And a special thanks to the IAS, Marsha, Kieran, uh, Babna, and Laura, who've just been outstanding. And I'm, I'm, I'm leaving soon. I'm really going to miss it. I've had a wonderful time here. So thank you so much for your hospitality and for, for welcoming here. So I'll, I'll get right to it. My interests are really in how games can communicate meaning. And so I apply that in a, in a few different ways. And today I'm going to talk about how games can communicate something that's quite, quite urgent, uh, climate change. So uh, a quick agenda, I'm going to talk about the problem with um, what's called the urgency gap. And somewhat distressingly, when I was looking to see if this term, the urgency gap had come up before, way back in 2006, this was discussed as, a, as essentially a problem between the urgency of the issue of climate change and how people are reacting. So this is unfortunately nothing new. Then I'm gonna look at why games and why games might be especially well-suited to communicating urgency and also helping us perhaps find some solutions. I'll then spend a little bit of time talking about rule-based systems and procedurality. So this is one of the ways that games communicate meaning most effectively. I'll then talk a little bit about uh, one climate change game in particular called Civilization Gathering Storm, which is a couple of years old now and is part of this very popular civilization series. I'll then have a conclusion and then hopefully, if I can stop myself, uh, some time for questions as well at the end. So my basic argument is, is, is quite straightforward. It's that games are an effective tool for highlighting the urgency of climate change. They can compress lengthy processes and in turn demonstrate long-term consequences and outcomes very rapidly. Now this isn't unique to video games or games in general. We do computational models all the time to show how very lengthy processes happen. And we can do this, this very quickly, but games are just, just one of the ways we can do this in, in an engaging manner that helps us reach a lot of different people. A couple of caveats to start. Games are not a silver bullet and there's no single approach that is going to work. Within gamification, and especially as it's approached, uh, applied in education, there's sometimes this idea that games are going to save the world. Um, games can be applied to anything. Sometimes we call it the chocolate covered broccoli approach, where if you just make something a game, no matter how dry or boring the content, then it will become fun and it'll become more engaging. It's not as simple as that at all. At all, excuse me. So I, I want to put that out there. Games I'm really treating as one tool in the toolkit. We really need a multifaceted, um, really full-throated approach to addressing this issue. Second caveat, video games are terrible for the environment. Um, like much worse than I ever would have imagined, to be honest. So here's a quotation from a study from 2019. So this has gotten much worse. With the pandemic, uh, use of gaming went through the roof for obvious reasons. People were stuck at home. Um, but I just want to draw your attention to that bolded element at the bottom there. So in the US, household gaming is equivalent to that of 85 million refrigerators or 5 million cars on the road. So we're talking about huge amounts of power consumption. Now, part of this is just that as the need for like graphics to look better, you need higher powered graphics cards, you need bigger power supplies, so there's that side. But also, if you think about mining for the materials, like the raw materials you need for consoles, graphics cards, PCs, etc., there's just a lot of energy that goes into making a video game. Uh, well, I should say, um, Ben Abraham has a fantastic book called uh, Digital Games After Climate Change, which just came out this year, I believe, which really goes into that um, uh, quite in detail. So the urgency of the problem, how bad is it? I mean, I think we all, we all know, but um, just to set the context a little bit, if you look at the headlines from a number of different um, outlets, so here we have the New York Times, BBC, the Wall Street Journal, that, uh, and Globe and Mail from Canada, um, we see that this is getting attention. Right, the IPCC released a report in February and then a mitigation report in April, and this made a lot of big headlines. Okay. Unfortunately, not as much in the television news media, which certainly in the Canadian and American contexts is, is really what drives a lot of the public discourse. 
But this is a, a really big deal. And if you aren't familiar, the IPCC um, sixth assessment report was quite dire. I mean, it, it's dire every year, but um, it was really saying we're at a make or break moment. We have to do something. Countries aren't doing enough. Corporations aren't doing enough. This is, this is a big moment. Um, more recently, like right now, we see in parts of India and Pakistan, they're going through a just a sweltering heat wave, which has these really catastrophic results. So climate change isn't something that is like going to happen. It is happening. And we're already feeling the effects of that. So there is this real, real urgent need to do something. Just a quotation here. The dangers of climate change are mounting so rapidly that they could soon overwhelm the ability of both nature and humanity to adapt, creating a harrowing future in which floods, fires, and famine displace millions, species disappear, and the planet is irreversibly damaged. Okay, so pretty bleak stuff. Now, so I mentioned that IPCC report, it's like the one that came out in, um, in the spring, and that made headlines for a day or two, and then <coughs> something else really important happened. The Will Smith slap at the Oscars, which just drowned out everything else. And this is a big problem, right? The attention economy and you know, what are people paying attention to? What, what gets a lot of the attention? It's the, you know, these, these scandals and these things which in the grand scheme of things are quite trivial, but are exciting and, and take up a lot, of, a lot of the air. So in practical terms, we know this means increased frequency of extreme weather events, forest fires, especially in Canada and Western Canada and the United States, British Columbia and California, especially, but also Oregon and uh, Washington state. Fire season has always been there. It used to be about a month or six weeks of really bad forest fires. Now it's just extended every year. It's the worst fire season they've ever had. And this causes catastrophic, uh, catastrophic destruction to not just the environment, but homes and, and livelihoods. Coastal flooding, we can see is already happening. Droughts, reduced air quality, disruptions to agriculture, and economic devastation for most. And this is another issue, is it's only going to really affect certain people and not others. Some people are going to come out of this okay. okay. Um, quite often the people who are already doing pretty okay. Right? So there's a, there's a real equity dimension to this as well. And one thing I just say that is a little bit tangential is that a big reason given for not doing anything on climate change is that it's going to hurt the environment. In my own country, we've there's been promises to reduce our reliance on fossil fuels. We're an oil producing nation, um, but our government just allowed a pipeline to go through and just signed a big oil lease off the coast of Newfoundland. So there's there's that dimension to it. However, we know now that there's actually a lot of economic benefits to converting to green energy sources. There are jobs. It's becoming less and less expensive to convert to wind and solar. One thing I'd say, um, just driving from the airport, the UK, uh, I've noticed lots of wind turbines. So there, there seems to be efforts in certain parts, but not in others. So we have this quite dire situation and you would think that it would matter more. We have no economy, we have no nothing without a planet to live on. And I, I put nations, corporations, and individuals in that order on purpose here. I think that's where the, really the, the burden lies. Uh, we need countries and corporations and uh, of course individuals, but you know, the, these encouragements to individuals to like eat red meat less twice a week or to um, drive less certainly may help, but that's not, that's not the big thing, right? It's, we know that the big producers are um, oil, oil producing nations and corporations. So Climate Action Tracker keeps, keeps track of these sort of things. And apart from the UK, which is doing actually not bad, they receive an almost efficient. <coughs> the G20 nations are doing uh, abysmally. Okay? So the Paris Accords, uh, we all know about quite well. Um, no, very few nations are doing enough. And in fact, of the 36 countries they, they track, only the Gambia uh, has its commitments in line with those, those targets. So really governments are not doing um, enough here. <clears throat> a Quinnipiac poll, which is a US-based poll. I'm not, so I didn't include Republicans because Republicans in the US don't seem to care much about climate change at all. But Democrats, you know, the, the 
ostensibly more progressive party. Uh, they, climate change doesn't even come across as one of the most important issues for them. Okay. Uh, among independents, about 8% said that was the most important. And somewhat distressingly, even in the 18 to 34 age range, only about 10% listed climate change as the most important. Now, as you'll see in a second, if you prompt somebody and ask them, do you care about climate change? You'll get a lot, of, a lot more people saying yes, it matters. But if you just come up to someone and say, what are you most worried about right now? It seems like inflation uh, or, or um, in this case, sometimes uh, immigration, the Ukraine war, et cetera. So people just don't really want to hear about it and tune out is kind of the problem here. I just want to look at a couple more data points. So like I said, if you prompt people, you get a little bit better responses. So here, this is a really great project out of Yale where they ask people, okay, is in the, in the States, is climate change happening? And so you'll get nationally an average of 72%. You can see it's broken down there in the States where the, the orange or redder uh, colors mean there's more, more agreement. Okay. And so you can see that there's quite wide scale agreement that climate change is happening. Okay, so it looks pretty good. And I'm gonna focus on the United States, just you know, not to pick on them, but because the United States is a tremendously wealthy country who has the technology and know-how to implement some really meaningful changes and mostly due to politics just isn't. Do um... you ask people, is global warming gonna harm future generations? Most people will say yes. And I want you to keep, keep that in mind for just, just a second. Um, and you can see here, 19% still say no, which is, I mean, that's still tens of millions of Americans, so it's a lot, but um, that's not bad. Here's where things start to get a little bit dicey. If you ask, is climate change caused by humans, you get a significantly lower number. And why that matters is that if human beings aren't responsible, then we don't have to do anything about it. And this is the one that I think kind of gets to the heart of, of my, my talk today. <clears throat> If you ask people, is climate change going to impact you personally? Most will say no. And you can see even in lefty hippie California there, only 54% of people are going to say yes. And like I said, they are living it right now, right? The, the, just the forest fires alone with the droughts and all, all sorts of other things are already happening. So this is the big problem. We know it's happening. We know it's urgent. In some cases it's facing people head on directly, but there's still not this, this urgency. Right? There's a disconnect between the urgency indicated quite loudly by the science and what the voting public thinks is urgent. And again, I think it's really important to target individuals, not in the sense of like using, you know, not using plastic straws, but if we can mobilize individuals as a voting group, a voting block, to put pressure on governments, right? Then it matters. When when politicians see those numbers, like people don't care, they are very there's very little incentive for them to do much about it. So I think that's where games, other entertainment media that are already reaching a lot of people may have some potential for reaching reaching this audience. So why games and what can they do? And I should just say that I'm a game studies researcher, so I'm focusing on games. There's obviously plenty of other media looking at this problem, documentaries, enter, you know, entertainment films. I remember in the uh, you know, early to mid 2000s, there was that big rush of documentaries and like the day after tomorrow, these Hollywood blockbusters that really dealt with climate change. So it's not that games are uniquely doing this at all. Although I will say in the past 10 years or so, climate change has been a, a much more frequent topic than games. And also I should say, I focus on video games primarily, but this certainly counts for board games as well. Uh, last week, I ran a great uh, seminar with some lovely folks, uh, postgraduate researchers, and had them make a climate change game in 45 minutes. And as far as I know, none of these students had made a game before, and they were able to produce some really great content in just, just about 45 minutes or so. And so I'm focusing mostly on analysis here, but I will say, especially at the, like the elementary school, primary school levels, getting uh, like kids to make games and really think about how they're embedding values into games is a really great way to get them interested and on board. 
So one way to think about games is as a, a mesocosm, which is a term that comes from ecology. And I'm getting a lot of this from a fantastic book from Melinda Chang called Playing Nature, the Eco Ecology in Video Games from 2019. So this to me is, as far as I know, the first book length study that looks at the relationship between games and climate and ecology, and also uh, uh, climate change. So a mesocosm is an experimental enclosure that typically tries to replicate a natural environment as closely as possible. So it's kind of like a mix between, you know, an ultra controlled lab experiment and then just going out into the field where there's there very few controls. So it's, you know, like a garden in a bottle is like one of these um, prototypical examples. So Chang writes, games like mesocosms are mini ecosystems, functional arenas of a size usefully intermediate between field experiments and laboratory conditions which replicates select aspects of the surrounding world. Okay, so what I think this is really interesting is we can look at games and how they represent systems, how they represent different facets of human society, of things like climate change, but they also provide really interesting experimental apparatus, I think. We can actually see how people engage with these systems and look at their behavior. Of course, it's not a perfect one-to-one -one model. Any lab experiment is not always going to translate perfectly into, into you know, outside of the lab. But I, I think one thing I'm increasingly interested in is just getting people to play games and getting their responses seen if they actually are learning anything from, from playing these games. So games we can kind of use in this way, they're this permeable space between the artificial world and the, the quote unquote real world. And they allow us, I think, to, to make some broader statements about how society systems and people operate. Now, why games? <clears throat> One, I'll be honest, a big reason I got into game studies because I played video games my whole life and I'm a curious person. And so I just thought, hey, I can, there's this new field and I can get into it and it all, all sort of worked out. So there is just a kind of haphazard selfish reason there. But I, I will also say, they're very good at representing systems. And in fact, I would argue they're better than most other media at representing systems. The relations between things, networks, causal, causal effects, right? How does one thing impact the other? Games are very good at this. Games require exploration and learning, right? I have to know how systems work. I have to be able to try to figure them out. So they automatically lend themselves quite well to learning. I said at the outset that gamification, which is just bringing game-like elements into non-game environments like work and education, isn't a silver bullet. But when done properly and thoughtfully, it actually there is research to show that it, it can in, uh, help engage learners and aid in, uh, in learning, even with very kind of crass metrics like test scores. Right? It, it can increase that. So the games, you have to figure it out. And so they, they just already lend themselves to teaching you how things work. They're ubiquitous, everybody plays games. Okay, so maybe you don't have a you know, PS5 or like a really high powered gaming ring at home, but you probably play like a board game or something once in a while or a card game, even Candy Crush or a mobile game on your phone while you're waiting for the train, like this stuff all counts. So games are, are ubiquitous, they're everywhere. They're fun, like that's, you know, again, a very simple reason. Getting to more why I'm into them is that they're very semiotically rich. And I'll explain what that means in just a second. They are just eminently themable. We can put any sort of theme or topic we want into games. We can express virtually whatever we want through games in a way that I think um, is not necessarily unique, but they just lend themselves to representation and communication really well semiotically. So for the multimodalists in attendance, I apologize. This is a, a vast simplification, but for our purposes, it will work. Okay. So semiotics is just the study of signs, right? Things that convey meaning, letters, images, uh, words. The, um, a mode, okay, now mode is like any other thing where there's some contestation about its exact meaning, but for our purposes, we can just think about it as a distinct way to create meaning. So I can create meaning through writing which is different from how I create meaning in speech or in moving image or like Ariana's work through dance and movement and, and gesture, okay? Multimodal semiotics then just looks at how individual modes work together to create meaning. 
The metaphor I really, really like that's used in multimodal, multimodality a lot is the ensemble. So this, if you think about an orchestra and ensemble where you have your woodwinds and your brass, your percussion, when you, at least for me, when I listen to a piece of music, I'm hearing it all at the same time, right? Now, if I'm a percussionist or if I am you know, play the clarinet, maybe I'm gonna to key to those certain elements, but it's really the overall composition that I'm hearing. If you think if I swap out the, uh, the brass section with bagpipes or something like that, um, I'm going to get a very different composition and overall sound. So another example I like to use are horror movies, right? So a big reason why horror movies are scary is because of the music. It's not just the visual content on screen. If you're ever really scared watching a scary movie, you mute it, a lot of the emotional resonance and the fear kind of goes down, right? It's because the visual and auditory components are playing off each other, they're reinforcing each other, right? Both of them go hand in hand quite well. Okay, so that's my one slide version of a field that is very large. Now, games are highly multimodal. We can communicate information in games by basically any way that we know how to communicate information. Okay. So we have text, image, you know, moving and still image, music, right? Music is a very emotionally evocative mode. Sound effects, haptics, which is like the um, vibrations or like tactility. Olfaction, which I, I kind of started a research trajectory and which is the sense of smell, um, but it kind of stalled. There's all these new products out here because of the rise of virtual reality that try to give you like smell vision for games and really interesting work. It just doesn't, it just hasn't happened yet. And mostly it just kind of makes you nauseous when, <laughs> when you smell these things. There's movement, um, the project Ariana and I are, are, are getting, getting started. And then procedurality, which I'll get to in a minute. Uh, one way to think about procedurality though is just like gameplay mechanics in a sense. <clears throat> so we can use the represent representative strengths of each mode to communicate meaning and messages, right? We know that music is good for communicating certain things. We know that writing is good and speech and gesture, et cetera. So we can combine all of these in a way to, to communicate meaning. Now I should say that it's never predictable. I come from a, a background in rhetoric, there's persuasion, and we can try all we like to persuade somebody of something, but we, we don't know if it's going to land. And so it's the same thing with games, right? Uh, or anything else. We can use a bunch of different modes and try to convey something, but it's not always going to work. Nevertheless, a multimodality is a really great framework for allowing us to break down the component parts of meaning in a game and try to come up with some you know, feasible and ideas about what, what to interpret and how to interpret. And I, so I use that screenshot from um, Final Fantasy 14 just because there's so much on it. I don't play that game, so that is incomprehensible to me, but there's just, there was kind of everything on the screen there. So all games function according to rule-based systems and causal processes. Now, like I just mentioned with the idea of modes, in game studies, we're somewhat embarrassed that we do not have a decent definition of game. Play is even worse. Now, if I say to you, you know, the word game, you get an intuitive sense of what it means, but theorizing it has proved tremendously difficult. We've all kind of tried to come up with our concrete definition of what a game is or play is, and it very quickly falls apart under scrutiny. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm being, um, you know, a bit of a shorthand here, but just in general, we can say all games function according to rule-based systems and causal processes. If I do X, Y happens. Okay, that's the basic structure of, of a game, not just games, but certainly games. So an example, if I roll a dice to indicate movement on a board. So here I've rolled a four. I know if I'm playing something like snakes and ladders or shoots and ladders, that I need to move four spaces on the board. So it's a very basic example of a rule. Okay. Most games also have a rule that has to do with win and fail conditions. So in most of these board games, I, I win by reaching the last space on the board. Right. And the games we made last week with the PGR group uh, were mostly what are called race games, where I start at the, at the beginning and, and try to race to get to the, the end first. And along the way, there's certain hazards, right? Like snakes and ladders is the kind of 
archetypal example of this. Now, I should say, not all games, this is where we get into trouble, not all games have a win condition necessarily. If you think of the game of, uh, we call tag, where it's like you run around and uh, get who's it, um, there's no real win condition there, right? You just kind of stop playing once you get tired of it. There's lots of children's games that are like this. Right? Children play games where they'll just like spin around so they can see how dizzy they can get um, in, in a circle. There's no real, I mean, they lose, they hurt themselves, but there's no real winning there. Okay. So in general, though, and certainly when you, when you look at video games, there's a, a win condition. I'll, I'll try to use an example I think we're all familiar with, which is Mario. And this actually isn't from Mario. This is from a fantastic uh, tool called Super Mario Maker, where it actually gives you all of the tools, like all the enemies and all like the, the pipes there, and you create your own levels. And people have made nightmarishly difficult levels in this. But it's actually a really great way to teach some fundamentals of game and level design. <coughs> So, you know, fun, at a basic level, I press A in my you know, old NES on input to make Mario jump. Okay. Now, here are some rules come in. And one way to think about these also is, is uh, what we, I get my students to do is to start off with what we call pseudocode. This is paper prototyping where they can just use a bunch of if statements, right? Like if this happens, then what else happens, right? So, you know, if I jump on top of a Goomba, that's that, that little enemy there. So you can see there's a poor flattened Goomba there and Mario gets 200 points for flattening him. I destroy it. So that's the way that the, uh, essentially the, the collisions are, are programmed in, that's the rule. Now, if Mario collides with the side of the Goomba, then he takes some damage. So if he's big, he gets smaller. If he's small, he dies, right? So again, these are very simple rules baked into to the game. I win by reaching the end of the level intact, or I lose by taking too much damage. Okay, so very basic rule-based systems that all games have. Obviously, the more complex the game, the more complex the rule systems, especially I find with some board games, they are super complex and you spend all the time reading the manual. <laughs> Um, rather than playing the game itself and try to explain to new players how it works. But this is something that all games have, are these rules. And we can make these rules say something. We can imbue them with messages, worldviews. And in fact, what I would argue is that they are always imbued with messages and worldviews, perhaps especially when we don't, we don't mean them to. So this is one of the, the key ways that games convey meaning is through their rule systems. If I don't know the rule that I have to jump on top of the Goomba and not to the side of Goomba, then I'm not going to do very well in the game. So right away, the game is teaching me something. In the original Mario, there is no, like in those days, there were no tutorials. You basically learned by trial and error and you figured it out. Okay, so again, games are very good at just prompting us to learn. So procedurality, just to return to this, if I do X, Y happens. I really want us to keep this, this basic model in mind. Now here's, here's the kicker. Because I'm the one who is inactive, X, I am responsible for Y, for better or worse. And sometimes that's not fair. Sometimes Y is completely unpredictable, like a slot machine, right? My X is still pulling the, the lever or pressing the button, but ultimately I've, I've done this. A couple of books that are really important to procedurality. I should say procedurality is very established in game studies. It's been around for at least Janet, since Janet Murray's Hamlet on the Holodeck, which is kind of uh, 1997 is around when we say game studies started. So game studies is quite new as a discipline. People have studied play and games for millennia, but as an academic discipline, these two books here are really the go-tos. Uh, and Ian Bogos, Persuasive Games, so procedurality examines how we can commu communicate meaning through processes and rule systems. Again, all games have these rule systems and processes. Right? How do we define X and Y? How do you define victory and fail conditions? So I, my victory condition could be to save the planet or it could be to make money, right? I, automatically, maybe you can see how we can imbue values there. And again, importantly, the player engages with the rules and in doing so enacts the processes. So rules can seem quite abstract, but they're actually very material, right? We have to put them into play, so to speak, 
to make them uh, happen and, and manifest them. So another apology to any climate scientists in the room, another gross simplification. But if we think about the way that we could code climate change into a video game in particular, we might follow a model that looks something a little something like this. Okay? So we know human beings have energy needs for heating, manufacturing, travel, et cetera. We extract fossil fuels to convert into energy. Consuming fossil fuels results in generating pollutants. Generating pollutants leads to a warmer environment. A warmer environment leads to extreme weather events, loss of agricultural land, et cetera. All those things we looked at at the outset. Okay, so there's a process here. And again, games are very good at representing processes. So perhaps because of this, there are many climate change games. If you just Google climate change games, you'll get hundreds and hundreds of hits. Actually, NASA had a really great archive of playable games just through the browser, but it was all Flash-based, and so Flash is no longer supported by Adobe, so it's gone. <clears throat> Here, this game, I just brought this up um, because it came across my Twitter feed yesterday or the day before. So these things are coming up all the time. This is a, uh, a game that's accompanying a book on eco-socialism. And it's a really interesting game. Uh, it's a very typical climate change game, right? So a lot of these work, just to give you some idea, by resource balancing. So they'll say, you're the mayor of a town or the prime minister of a country. You have X amount of money, X amount of things like political capital, and you have to spend them to be able to run your city while keeping it carbon neutral or by reducing your emissions. Okay, so maybe converting to wind power is going to cost you so much money and political capital. Maybe uh, uh, introducing more like a light rail system or you know a, a tram or a streetcar as we call them is going to uh, help reduce emissions, but the car and oil lobbies aren't going to like those. So you have to burn political capital. That's, it's, that's kind of like the way that most of these work. And so you have to balance the amount of resources you have with achieving your, your aims, your, your climate or ecological aims. Carbon City Zero is one that was made just at uh, Manchester Metropolitan. Um, it's a deck building game where you try to create carbon neutral a city. And it's again, it's the same sort of idea. But I wanna spend the, the next maybe 10, 10 or 15 minutes, or yeah, probably more like 10 minutes uh, looking at is Civilization Gathering Storm. Civilization is this tremendously popular series uh, played by millions and millions of people. And why I want to focus on this is part of the problem with these climate change games I just mentioned. They're really well designed. They're fantastic. They're not a ton of fun. Okay? They are meant primarily as educational tools. Um, and I actually will say the deck building game I just noticed was fun. It's one of the exceptions, <laughs> I should say. <laughs> Um, but like that eco-socialist game was, is fun, it's browser-based, or sorry, it's, it's interesting, it's browser-based, but it's not what I would call like fun or, or engaging. Um, so civilization is a lot of fun. A lot of people already play it. So that's why I'm focusing on it. It has just a lot of reach. If you're not familiar, it's, the series has been around for a long time. You start picking a civilization. So this can be like, in the example I'm gonna give you, I chose uh, Rome, the figurehead of Caesar, but you can be like Greek, uh, Greece, or um, uh, even like um, smaller countries. Uh, so you can basically pick a bunch of different civilizations. You start in 4000 uh, BCE, where you have like very, like, you know, stone age tools, and you build it up over time, uh, all the way into the future. So the gameplay is basically during each turn, players make improvements to their civilizations. So I need granaries to feed my population. I need roads. I need to develop technologies like bronze working and masonry. And I just get more and more technologically advanced. Now, a really key thing about civilization is you have resources. So I have a certain amount of money, uh, et cetera. I have to keep my citizens happy. That's a really key mechanic. Okay? They are happy when they are healthy, when there's things to do, when there's when you give them like amenities, like a circus, okay? Um, so that's really important. And when production is high, right? So I, I need to always keep the civilization going. I need to continually keep it going. So keeping your citizens happy is really important. If they get unhappy, then your production will fall. Eventually they can revolt and you lose the game. 
Now each tile, uh, so you see here, I don't know how it shows up, you have these hexagonal tiles. Each one has a specific use. So for example, farmland uh, or food production. Yeah, I can choose which governments I want and I can win in a number of ways. So there's a military conquest, which is usually the easiest. But there's also a science victory if I get, uh, if I make a space station or there's even actually diplomatic victories where I can use soft power to win. So here I'm just gonna give a, a quick sense of, this is just some gameplay footage. So here I'm Rome, this is a bit late game, this is like 1705. Um, and you can see I have all these cities, I'm the purple, I have a neighboring civilization that's in green, I'm thinking about declaring war, I decide against it. And you can just see how I have these different cities, you can see I have some farmland there. You can see I'm very close to water, well, that'll be, become important in just a second. But this, this, again, it's very much about managing the civilization and, and keeping it going and eventually winning the game. Now you can play either against the computer where there's an AI or against other people. Um, and the, the AI is usually quite good. So you have to really, really keep up on it. In 2019, Civilization VI introduced this gathering storm. It's called a, an expansion. So it wasn't part of the in, the, in the primary base game, there's no real climate change system. Now this is kind of strange because in the earlier civilization games, you had to manage things like pollution. Uh, they got rid of it a couple, maybe like 10 years ago with um, I think civilization four or five. I'm not sure why, um, but here they really focused on it explicitly. So here there's this really neat little screen which keeps track of how much you are contributing to climate change, the global state of things. Okay? So you can see there, this is early in the game. So polar ice, I haven't lost any yet. The global temperature is doing okay. My CO2 levels are low. On the right, you can see that there are different natural disasters, which are going to happen no matter what. But as climate change gets worse, as CO2 enters into the atmosphere more and more, then there are going to be more frequency of, of these natural disasters. And what I like here is that it really proceduralizes and, 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 and details the consequences. I can see at a glance, very simply, if I make too many coal factories, I, my climate change uh, levels are going to increase, right? So that X and Y again, I can see what's happening. I made the decision to create a coal plant um, or I made the decision to stick with fossil fuels instead of eventually move to uh, renewables like wind. And I can see in a very, albeit simplified way, how the game is making an argument for how climate change works and the impacts of it. And what are some of the impacts? I can lose some of those tiles to flooding, right? If the sea levels start to rise too much and I'm around a river, I can start to lose agricultural land. I start losing agricultural land. I can't feed my citizens. My citizens get unhappy, they revolt, I lose. Okay. So again, this very process-driven way that the game is communicating how climate change works. And although it's obviously not like a real life stake, you feel this. You spent all this time developing your, your system and your civilization just to have it ruined by a flood. Okay, so it, it stings a little bit. So again, I'm being faced very directly with the impacts of, of not taking climate change seriously. I can get hurricanes and storms. So here we have a quite large hurricane and it can in, in fact wipe out um, entire cities. I can lose citizens from it. Again, all this work I've done, I'm, if I don't pay attention to my climate levels, then I'm going to pay for it. Another screen I wanna show you is this climate tracker. So this is really handy in a, in a, in a pie chart form it tells me globally which civilization is the worst emitter. And here I'm afraid to say it looks like England is so it's signified by the crown there on the red um, pie chart on the left is the worst emitter. Okay, and what I love about this system is it demonstrates how global warming is truly a global system. And this is actually one of the challenges of the game, um, which I'll mention in a second, 
it's frustrating that I do everything right. I've converted to wind, I've done all these things, but these other civilizations are not, and they, I'm still getting increases in catastrophic storms, et cetera. Okay, on the right chart, you can see it's supposed to be a pie chart, but I can see that that's the um, symbol for coal. I can see that I'm getting 100% of my CO2 contribution from coal. So this is telling me, you know, maybe I need to move away from coal as a primary means for um, energy production. Now, again, on the one hand, it gamifies your emissions somewhat. Right? I can see this and I can like start to play a little game. I can try to balance it and bring it down, right? We know like things like Fitbit, right? Uh, or like step trackers. It's actually a pretty effective and simple way to get people to um, you know, try to beat their personal best, et cetera. On the other hand, because it shows it's a global problem, it can be quite frustrating and actually at times a little bit demotivating. So again, I'm doing all of this hard work, these others aren't, and I'm, I'm making these sacrifices. A really interesting knockoff effect here that was not programmed into the game. So this is what's called emergent gameplay. This is just stuff that happens that the designers didn't really intend. As I lose more and more of my land of flooding, the easiest way to really ramp up production again and get my citizens happy is to invade a neighboring civilization. Right. So here, I think we have a pretty clear, again, a procedural argument that climate change, we, we have start to fight over fewer and fewer resources. We can see how it's going to impact things like conflict globally. And again, this is just how, because of the systems in place, the rules and the processes, we get these sort of uh, arguments coming out of it. Now it's not all gloom and doom, this is really important. There are ways to mitigate climate change and the game really rewards you for this. Now I should say, you know, the game takes place over 6,000 years or whatever it is. You can play a game in about three or four hours. Okay, so very quickly, if I start to introduce like wind turbines instead of coal power, I can see, I can see impacts, right? I can start to, to get my, my CO2 emissions down. And really with enough practice and planning, you can have a successful civilization without ruining the planet. And in fact, there's, there's a chance element involved, but you do eventually gain advantages over civilizations who do not curb emissions, right? If say, I don't know, Greece is staying with coal and oil, okay, they will start to lose their agricultural land, will start to have more of that flooding. And so it becomes much more difficult for them to compete. So with the, the wind condition that's baked in here, it's actually quite advantageous in a lot of ways to convert to wind and to engage in behaviors that are, are better for the environment, better for the climate. So just kind of to, to, to wrap up what I think the procedural argument here in, in, is in uh, uh, the civilization series and then this expansion in particular, right? I build factories to increase increase production and citizen happiness. And this happens, right? I, I get a short-term goal. I get a short-term gain where my citizens are happy, things are motoring along, everything's great. But factories start, they produce carbon emissions. Now there's a bit of a lag, just like in real life. But eventually these carbon emissions will lead to negative outcomes like we just saw storms and flooding. Productivity and happiness decrease and eventually citizens may revolt or other civilizations will overtake you. So the procedural argument here is that the short-term gains of fossil fuels and other energy uh, ways, ways to produce energy, excuse me, are in the end not worth it and are in the end going to come back to haunt you. Now I will say that civilization is not perfect. One of the issues that's come up in the criticism is that it actually forces you to take a fairly linear path. So I have to do uh, coal and oil first before eventually going over to wind. Um, and you can do nuclear, which I know there's some debate about what, you know, how clean that is or not. But I, I, I do have to kind of go through this. And so it's, this, it's kind of this deterministic view of progress and technological advance that's quite problematic. And again, all of this happens in a matter of hours instead of decades and centuries. I am confronted with the consequences of not paying attention to climate change very rapidly. I lose in the game. I, it's more difficult for me to win in the game if I don't pay attention to climate change. Again, lots of games do this, but I think civilization in this expansion in particular does this in a way that's also engaging, fun, and just reaches a lot of people. 
I think I'm just about out of time, so to conclude, there's a disconnect between the urgency of the problem and a lack of urgency in finding solutions. One reason is just we don't see it in the day to day. There are other reasons. There's misinformation campaigns. It's just a lot to think about. The you know there's existential dread involved, but one reason is certainly that we don't see it in the day to day. Games provide one avenue among many for demonstrating the causes, consequences, and potential solutions in a compressed amount of time. One thing I'd like to see and I'm interested in is how future studies could maybe compare games with other media, perhaps documentary, uh, in creating a sense of urgency. So we could do a very simple study um, with questionnaires, um, getting people in the labs playing games. So I think there's a lot of, of room for a, a more empirical version of this work and uh, of a way to branch out into some other disciplines as well. Thanks very much. I welcome any questions.